recognition. No, we know who we are. We're not really going to kiss anybody's butt to get recognition. We ain't going to do that. They're going to come back. They want to gamble. We want gambling to be part of this reservation. This, I would say it's, it's fast. It's fast money. But as long as they got their thumb on your head and they can step on you, they're going to keep you there. We, we took this land from them. We came in, we drove them off the land. We said, you don't use it as well as we do. Now. forever like before they got into uh the fancy the fancy stuff you know they used to use it uh, for utilitarian reasons you know and then they just started getting into being more artistic with it so as far as i know personally it's been around for a long long time Welcome to Indian Images. I'm Aaron Clark. And I'm Bob Solarski. Over the last few months, many of you have probably read or at least seen news reports about Indians in our area. Indians fighting Indians, Indians fighting state police, and Indians fighting local governments. Violence and conflict. If you've never been to an Indian community, it is certainly easy to believe that that's what it's all about. But there really is much more to the Indian story. It's true. It's a struggle in many regards, actually. It's a struggle to resolve the past to save a dying culture in some terms, and to find some sort of economic independence. And that is the story we will be telling tonight. Before we dive right into the nuts and bolts of our program, some background on the three communities we'll be visiting. When Indians are the topic of conversation around here, people are usually talking about the Mohawks of the Aquasasne Reservation near Messina, New York. They're known for their gambling disputes with the state pollution battles with corporate giants, and for more peaceful pursuits like traditional basket making. The reservation straddles the U.S.-Canadian border, covering 24,000 acres. Eight to 10,000 Mohawks live here, about half on the American side of Aquasasne, or as the Mohawks translate it, land with a partridge drum. Less visible but nearly as controversial, the Ganyanka Mohawks, who make their home just outside of Altona, New York. The Ganyanka territory is not a reservation. These Mohawks repossessed their land, first taking over an abandoned camp in Moss Lake in 1974. After negotiations with the state, the Mohawks moved to their present territory, a total of about 6,500 acres in the Minor and Macomb State Parks. As for population, well, Mohawks here are still afraid the state may try to retake this land, they say they may someday be invaded by state police. And so, they say their population is a military secret. Across Lake Champlain in Swanton, Vermont, a lesser-known group of Indians is fighting for their identity. The Abenakis originally settled along the Missisquoi River. Over the years, they've pretty much blended into white society here, but that is changing. Led by outspoken Chief Homer St. Francis, the Abenakis are pushing land claims and battling for state and federal recognition. The Abenakis don't actually own any tribal land. They base tribal operations out of this old railroad building. As we said, three very distinct societies, but there are some common threads. One tie that binds money. Everybody needs it, and each community is trying to find ways to get it. Bob has spent an awful lot of time reporting on the economics. How do Indians make money? 
Well, Aaron, when you're talking about Indians and money, you've got to talk about two things. You've got to talk casinos and bingo halls. That's where the fast cash is. But for many Indians, the issue, issue isn't just making money. It's also how the money is made and how they can establish a broader economic base. And it does appear that they're trying. Um, the Abenakis of Vermont, to be honest, have a long way to go economically. The Mohawks are further along in Aquasasne. They do have an economic development office, and they're working with the state trying to bring in some small industries. The Ganyanka Mohawks are really focusing on community-owned businesses. But you have to understand that in recent years, some Indians have been forced to change their economic emphasis, if you will, Fishing, for example, for various reasons, is really no longer a viable industry for many Indians, and for one Indian in particular. Those who know him call him the King of the Muskies. Even he would tell you he's the King of the Muskies, and with good reason. For nearly 70 years, Tony Barnes has lived near the banks of the St. Lawrence River. He's a Mohawk, living on the Aquasasne Reserve. And while he worked for many years as an Indian police officer, and a Franklin County Deputy Sheriff, he made a good living teaching people from around the world how to fish these waters, helping them set records in the process. Uh, well, the, the writers, you know, the sports writers that came here to take pictures of uh, the fish that we caught, you know, the muskies, and uh, finally they said, we'll come every day, sometimes twice a day to take a picture. And I was filled up till uh, June sometime. Then they would call in for July and August, and then the musky fishermen would call in for uh, September and October, you know. So I was filled up every year like that. Tony would house his visitors in trailers that are no longer here and take them out in boats that he sold some years ago. Financially, he was more secure than many Indians who have trouble finding jobs in areas like this that offer little. But pollution from industries upstream from his home ended his fishing guide business, as well as a plentiful supply of food from the water and land. That's when it started, 85. The phone, you know, uh, PCB and, oh, mercury, everything. There's five different chemicals in that. It's not safe to eat the fish, no. It's not safe no more. And uh, for uh, two or three years, I couldn't even... Kind of a vegetable garden, you know. And so the history of Tony Barnes became the same as the history of Indians almost everywhere. A story of success and prosperity in the past, and now a present filled with the struggle to get by. There was a good old day, like I was telling you, eh? To Abenaki Indians in Swanton, Vermont, the story of a Tony Barnes is nothing new. There's a collective fight around here to find enough money to get by. But when the government of the white man doesn't even recognize you as a tribe, finding help from the outside is difficult at best. And the struggle to survive here is a responsibility that rests largely on the shoulders of one man, Homer St. Francis, who was elected by his people, the chief of Abenakis here for life. So they got problems. You know, they got drinking problems, dope problems, and that whole bit. Uh, we're no different than anybody else. And we never claimed to be. But when you have a governor here, supposed to be, uh, she's a Jew with that, now a repressing us, and there they're hollering, Holocaust this and Holocaust that. I mean, yeah, she's sat down repressing us. Now, does it make a difference who's being repressed or what? Of the Indian groups in northern New York and Vermont, the Abenakis have the farthest to go in terms of a recognized political system and more importantly, perhaps, an economy. They have won a few battles, though, such as the right to fish nearby waters without a license. But victories like that do little when securing a long-term economic future is at stake. Well, if I had a hall, I'd set up a gambling hall to do, but it'd be bingo. Uh, and, uh... Most of the people around here don't have money to play slot machines anyway. I know of anyway. People I know of play bingo, but they wouldn't play the other because they can never afford it. But on the other hand, if you wanted to fly them in like they do in uh, Jersey City or Reno or, or, or Nevada, hey, there's people out there who got big bucks. So, because if 
become self-sufficient, then you don't have to depend on any government, so-called state or federal. But as long as they got their thumb on your head and they can step on you, they're going to keep you there. Somewhat further along, as far as a community structure and money are concerned, are the Mohawk Indians of Ganyanka. The land here is not a reservation, but a parcel near Altona, New York, the state says they can use. Land the Indians say has been theirs all along. If you ask a Mohawk how many people live here, he or she will probably tell you it's a military secret, and only a select few are allowed to be filmed. There's no chief here, but a traditional form of government, maybe thousands of years old. Baby Mohawks are born into the clan of their mother, either the bear, the turtle, or the wolf. Each clan and each person plays a part in community decisions when the Mohawks gather in their longhouse. Decisions are final only when each clan and each person has a say and a consensus is reached. Ganyanka spokesman, Daryl Martin. That's a lot of it's symbolic. If you're not careful, you can be caught, get caught up in the symbols. But it works as well today as it did 500 years ago. It works just as well today. It's a, it's a, it's a law, it's a constitution of the, of the mind as well as the heart. It's, it's mixed with um, culture. It's mixed with uh, tradition. And uh, the clearness of mind that is, that is stated before every meeting Every time we gather, it's always reminded to the people. So it's, you know, it works very well too. But the decisions that sometimes come from the turtle, bear, and wolf clans don't always jive with the laws written in Albany or Washington, D.C. One of those decisions, for instance, was to build a high-stakes bingo hall here, a decision that has brought the Mohawks into courtrooms and renewed their promises to protect Indian sovereignty. It's a game to thousands of non-Indians. To Mohawks here, though, it's the route to survival. It's a game that's uh, it's a fa it's a fast game. It's uh, it's this. I would say it's, it's fast. It's fast money. Um, it doesn't necessarily hurt anybody. It allows us to develop skills that we need in, the com in our community and as people. It advances our people beyond the level that they're at now. Not only in, in how to run a bingo, but also in how to um, become self-sufficient uh, by their own right. Um, with bingo, the proceeds from this bingo hall directly goes into the community. It doesn't go into an individual, doesn't go, all go to an individual, doesn't go to a group of individuals, it goes directly to the community. We don't want anything, and we will not take anything from the state, from the federal government, from any, any form of government aid, okay? We're out to be self-sufficient. We're out to stand on, on our own and be as, so, as a sovereign nation. So in Ganyanka, it's pretty cut and dried. Indians there wanted a bingo hall, and they have one. They say that's their sovereign right to establish businesses that help their community out. That may work in Ganyanka, but what about Aquasazni? Certainly not everyone there agrees with the gambling. True, and that's where a lot of the violence comes in. So you've got these casinos and bingo halls sparking violence and legal battles with the state. Some might say that they're not worth the trouble if it weren't for the money. And that's <laughs> the key, because it's an easy way make fast money. There are two kinds of people in the Ganyanka Bingo Hall, and neither sees anything wrong with the high-stakes games here, despite New York laws that do. First, there are the thousands who come to play, looking to win prizes that make life easy for a while. Then, there are the Mohawks who run the games, looking to make the easy profits that could mean economic independence for them. But the bingo alone is not an end for the Indians, but a means to finance other long-term businesses. For the time being, though, the money here is big and fast. And with the demand for the game as large as it is, the Mohawks are more than willing to supply it. It's allowed us to uh, afford the things that need to be done. It's an education. And uh, 
most importantly, it, it advances our people. But it seems, it, it seems like um, as time goes on and as we undertake different projects, it seems that the, there's only one thing that keeps coming up that stops us from, from taking two or three steps forward, and it's money. The profits from the bingo hall are invested in the Mohawk future. It's a Mohawk tradition to look seven generations forward when planning for the future, and the Mohawks here today are beginning to plan that far ahead. They want to build their own hydroelectric plant to provide themselves free and much needed power. They have a small fish farm, now stocked with a few salmon and trout, but swimming with the possibility of big business in the next few years. And what is an antique sawmill now, the Mohawks see as the beginning of their own lumber business someday. But all these projects need the money from bingo to become a reality, to keep them free from the handouts and rules of foreign governments. The state of New York is still debating the legality of the bingo hall in court. The Mohawks are arguing in court too, but they seem to care little about the outcome. This land is theirs as far as they're concerned, and the rules they make apply here. In Akwesasne, the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation, things are different than they are in Ganyanka or Swanton. While all have their troubles with federal and state laws, and all are seeking sovereignty, land, and financial independence, only here does the pursuit of economic freedom pit Mohawk versus Mohawk and Mohawk versus law so frequently and so violently. running around with AK-47. I'm willing to die to protect my family. What makes things hard to settle around here is a complex political structure and leaders with very different outlooks on the future here. There are elected chiefs, and traditional chiefs whose rules are often ignored. There are the warriors who defend Indian sovereignty in casinos and take it upon themselves to enforce only the rules they wish to. The ultimate goal is have the federal government say, hey, we've wronged you people. We've wronged your people and we want to make some rights. We want to make it right. The words that we promised you, we want to make right. And there are the anti-gamblers who've used violence to protect a traditional heritage, leaving a burned casino and battered gambling buses in their wake. To make things more complicated, the reservation straddles the border of two nations. Canada to the left of here, the U.S. to the right. There's an Indian police force on the left, but not on the right. Casinos on the right and not on the left. And the border through the reserve makes smuggling convenient. Harold Tarbell is the head elected chief on the American side, a strong opponent of gambling. Is that they've been doing this for four years now, and where's the prosperity? Where's the improved quality of life? Where's the security for those employees? Where's the professional development for them? Where's the shopping malls? Where's the arena? Where's the new clinic? These millions, perhaps billions of dollars have gone through here, and that hasn't happened yet. So where is it? It's in somebody's pocket, and it isn't anybody's here, as far as I can tell. It's an opportunity, but it can't be the only opportunity. I think that we have a variety of other economic opportunities that are being neglected because of this controversy. And I think it's that kind of undermining of the values that people were concerned about. What's going to become more important to us? Is tribal, the tribal sovereignty or is the security of this community going to be more important? Is our families going to be more important? Is individual responsibility going to be more important? Or is profit going to be more important? And for many of these people that are raising these issues, profit has become more important. But for every Harold Tarbell on the reserve, there's someone else who strongly supports gambling, saying it provides jobs and money to a community that needs both badly. There are plans for non-gambling businesses here in the future, and a land claim suit in state courts now could someday provide the Mohawks with a $600 million package 
of developed land. But Mohawks and Aquasasne need money and jobs now. Two of the elected chiefs are negotiating with New York to legalize casinos, but in the meantime, many casino owners are facing prison terms on federal gambling charges. The owners say they share their profits with the community to help everyone out if they were allowed, the way the owners of the Mohawk Bingo Palace do. The Bingo Hall is the only state and tribally sanctioned gambling operation on the reserve and has given the community over a million dollars in the past few years. Co-owner Gil White has collected many of the headlines made by Indians in Aquasasne throughout the gambling controversy. And despite the frequent violence, he believes casinos are a key to the future. I think anybody who has ever listened to anybody in the gaming business would have to uh, acknowledge that we've all said that this is not, you know, the panacea, the ultimate thing we'd like to see here. There's nothing wrong with a bingo hall staying here. But we also want other economic development. Heck, we want far more. You know, we want the tourism industry boosted. We want pollution-free industry. We want uh, light manufacturing. Uh, we want our own little banking industry. We want to be a little center of commerce. You know, and, and people who are against us try to say, look, all they want to do is bingo, or all they want to do is gamble. Well, that's nonsense. You know, we, we had to start somewhere. And it's very, very difficult to get uh, investors to come onto a reservation and, and be the first business or the first person uh, or the first uh, uh, industry to start. It's, it's a whole lot easier when, when somebody else starts. So we've made the start, and now, you know, we've, we've created a need for other industries, spin-off things like hotels, like uh, increased uh, tourism uh, uh, facilities. And once we do that, and we have uh, several hundred or several thousand people working, then we have a need for our own uh, shopping facilities. We need, have a need for our own banking institutions. One thing leads to the next. Few here deny that gambling brings money in. But many people here are getting tired of the whole dispute and the state police raids. But to those like Tony Barnes, who fear what casinos may bring besides an economy, opposing them is worth the fight. And, uh, it's affecting the kids already, you know, on a bus. Uh, 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 they get, uh, you know, harassed from the gamblers' kids, you know. They got the power and all that, you know. Yeah, it's affecting the kids, too. It's bad on the reservation, the coke. Not just the pot, no. It's coke. Crack. Yeah. Up here, crack? Yeah, sure. How do you know? I mean, you don't know the police force. You can't see the arrests and stuff. What do you hear about this? Well, I even know the dealers. <laughs> I know the dealers. The plight of Indians here and elsewhere doesn't go unnoticed off the reservations. Even Governor Mario Cuomo doesn't hesitate when he says more needs to be done for Indians everywhere. And they are maybe the most troubled population in the United States of America. And it is a matter of embarrassment, even shame to the rest of us, that the Indians are treated the way they are. They lead in uh, alcoholism and unemployment and all sorts of problems. It's a group that has been left out. We have ignored them. And let's face it, we, we took this land from them. We came in. We drove them off the land. We said, you don't use it as well as we do. Now, you can forgive yourself by saying it was 200 years ago and it wasn't you. But we're the, the inheritors of these people who took the land from the Indians. It seems to me that morally we owe them something. While words like Cuomo seem encouraging to Indian nations, Indians we've talked to say they've heard it all before. WPTZ-TV is proud to be involved in many levels in our community. In 1989, Channel 5 donated over $1 million, producing and airing public service announcements that have directly helped these organizations. And takes... ...in need brings us a great fear... archaeological records of their life ways.
Peter Thomas and crew dig for the scraps of history you can still touch. The bone and stone proof of human lives. Signs as subtle as a lump of charcoal. That orange stuff is just up at the top. And we haven't come on through it anywhere else. An arm practice guy might see only dirt. But when they find that charcoal, these archaeologists see a campfire, a cooking pit. Families hunting and fishing, moving as the water moved up and down the slopes by this bridge. It's obviously Indian. So there's no nice signature left on artifacts that you say, oh, the Abenakis left me or, oh, the Iroquois left me. Well, I'd like to tell you this story. So I'm going to use this belt right here uh, to explain a little history about the Iroquois. Archaeologists can still hope to touch rare scraps of history, but great fans of Indian history aren't nearly so tangible. It's a history told in stories and pictures, stories passed down for hundreds, even thousands of years. You can find some in books now, but most are better experienced person to person, illustrated in bright colors and lean drawings. Up here in the Northeast, they didn't have a written language like the Mayans of the Yucatan did, so they would do it this way. And every one of these symbols and figures that you see on a bell, they just simply act like a note or an aid to memory to the storyteller. Here, John Fadden tells the story of the Iroquois Confederacy, the first documented North American government by and for its people. So it was because of this ancient Confederacy that the sun shone brightly in the heart of the Iroquois people. They were quite happy when they lived here in America under their tree of peace. And that's it in a nutshell. Baden runs the Six Nation Museum just outside on Shiota. From the door to the back wall, floor to ceiling, it's a portrait of Indian lives, victories and losses. Baden's father started collecting as a young man, traveling around the country, listening to other Indians. And when an, uh, a young man uh, hitchhikes across the state to, to speak with you, this, these older people are going to respond positively to that and be impressed by this effort. So a lot of information that he gathered was, was uh, at those times when he was young. When their home began looking like a museum, the elder Fadden opened one. Over 2,000 visit each short summer season. But will visitors find this here in 35 years more? Fadden hopes so. As long as I'm alive, it will be. And I have three sons, but they're as of an age where their priorities are a bit different. <laughs> and I can relate to that. I remember being that age as well. When Indian families hold to the traditional ways, they're passing on history to their children to a degree most American kids just never experience. Fadden knows more urban, less traditionally raised children aren't exposed to that history. There's a good chance they'll grow up never knowing the story. Their children will learn this, whatever information they do know from the school systems. And uh, again, if the school systems were like they were 20 years ago, then they'd have a real problem. You know, you can't have a good self-esteem if you feel that uh, your ancestors were savages. History is, uh, isn't that linear. It's like it's right now, part of it. Like the moon that we were looking at a moment ago, that's the same as our grandmother. And she's still there and she always will be. very earliest Indian histories wrapped in the politics of white and Indian cultures. Anthropologists will tell you America's Indians got here about 75,000 years ago. But some Indians will tell you that's really a white trap, a way of saying Indians never really had the right to claim this land as their own. And while the front gate at Ganyanka proclaims 50,000 years of Mohawk history, the anthropologists say Indians probably didn't live here till about the Neither group knows a whole lot about day-to-day -day life then. Mostly, it was a struggle to survive in a difficult climate to find and grow food. And when the first white settlers arrived, the Mohawks discovered they had even more mouths to feed. Ganyanka spokesman Louis Hall says those settlers seemed to forget it was the Indians who helped them survive their first winters here. You see, the French didn't know how to grow corn or potatoes or beans and things like that. They had to learn it that here, you know, in America. Thanksgiving wasn't the only day Indians fed the white settlers here. Hall says Indians toiled for years in virtual slavery, growing food that fed French settlers in Canada till one 17th century day. They announced they're not going to move anymore. They're going to stay there now. 
And then if they work, they're going to be paid. The ultimatum mm -hmm. didn't work. White settlers out. continued to push the Mohawks under what's now the Kaknawaga Reserve. Hall says when the Mohawks got too strong there, half the community was simply moved downriver to what's now the Akwesasne Reservation. It separated them, you know, divide and conquer. Uh, it's a mutual, you know. And uh, that worked, you know. And then there's Vermont's Abnakis. The Abnakis were so absorbed into the growing white community that for years historians denied they ever really existed. We went through the court system of genealogy, and lo and behold, the state of Vermont says there's only 30 or 32 Native Americans. So we're still fighting the issue. You know, we know who we are. We're not going anywhere. We're here. Much of Indian history after the 17th century is a struggle to hold on to Indian identity and culture. Paul says he's seen it personally. He describes what happened to some Onondagas living in Syracuse, people who took on Christian religion and white culture. He says it killed their fighting spirit. Near 10 years later, houses were falling in, the roofs were falling in. See, they, uh, they, they develop a leak. They don't go up and repaired, like same gone Hawaii, you know, or the Zossin, they'd repaired right away, you know. No, all they do is put pail, a pail where it's leaking, so when it gets pretty bad, it pays all over the house, but they won't repair the roof even. Our site is, if you will, like a book, and what we're trying to do is to find the most important books to understand what human life was like. The state wants Thomas to find out what is this land before it's dug up for a new bridge. While development threatens tangible Indian history, that intangible web of memory and culture is threatened by assimilation. Indian history is the here and now as part of what keeps Indian culture alive. Losing that history can mean losing energy. It's a drive Paul says Indian society can't live without. When uh, people give up the struggle, die out and become extinct. People who continue the struggle, increase in number, grow strong, and achieve survival. History has not always been kind to the Indians, and neither have the history books for that matter, but each community we visited is actively trying to change all that. And a good example of that is this. It's a curriculum put together by the Abenakis of Vermont. It breaks down some of the old Hollywood stereotypes, teaching grade school children that Indians are not barbarians or savages, offering perhaps a little more realistic view of history. So the schools are <laughs> trying to come around. But not all lessons are learned in a classroom. Indian elders are once again making a conscious effort, at least, to teach the ancient traditions to the next generations. Right now, I'm teaching my grandchildren. One is 11 years old, the other one is 10. And they're getting very good at, at weaving now. Uh, like this. Mm -hmm. they're, they're getting very good at it. And they're my partners. The basket makers of Akwasasmi, artists at work. Donna Cole runs the Akwasasmi Museum. She is also a sort of den mother for this group. Oh, you just start with the black ash log, and then a um, uh, man has to pound it and make notches in there, and then it pounds, and then it, as, as they pound it down, then it's sort of like the annual ring on the tree is what comes up, and that's what they pull off, and that's how we get our splints. And then um, the ladies have to shave it and clean off the sides and divide it into the thickness, that forcefulness that they need for their basket maker. The uh, sweet grass has a distinct root to it, so they have to sort it out from other grasses. So it has to be cleaned also. And then they go, from there it has to be dried, and then they can go into the process of making baskets. Each basket maker puts their own artistic twirls in a split. It's a whole process of, it's a creativity process. You know, it's a... Uh, it's not like there's only one way to do it, and this is the way you're going to do it. You know, they, they, it's a whole creation process. This really is the Mohawk version of a sewing bee. The basket makers socialize, often in Mohawk. 
spoke, don't you? The language is as much an endangered art as the basket making, although like the basket makers, many Mohawks are trying to make sure the language survives. And they say education is the key. As far as the language goes, there is a revival of sorts happening. This is the Freedom School. All subjects are taught in Mohawk. Parents started it specifically because they wanted to save the language. The language is very important for the Mohawk people, and right now our language is dying. Um, and I'm really concerned about it because with the language goes our identity, goes our ceremonies, goes our songs, goes the, uh, how to use the medicines, how our connection with the spiritual world how, how that connection is made is through the language. And without it, uh, we're just not a people anymore. And one of those traditional ceremonies is the Thanksgiving prayer, said by these children every single morning. <laughs> It's not just a plant, it's a life. It's everything here as a, a spirit. The trees are the spirit, the water, every, all the life in the water. Have, our beings are life and have a spirit. And, and I think in teaching all of this, it, you can't help but gain a respect for each living thing on the earth. Margie Skeeters runs this alternative school. She says sometimes it's a real struggle. Parents do have to pay tuition, and sometimes the children have a hard time making the transition to public schools later. Still, she says it's worth it. If I didn't believe it was worth the struggle, I wouldn't be here. And every parent that brings a child here, if they didn't really firmly believe it, they wouldn't be here. Awesome. This is the only school in the Ganyanka Mohawk territory. Like the Freedom School, it is also total immersion. Gasamade is the teacher here. She and her husband just recently moved to Ganyanka. She says to get back to the basics of Mohawk culture. The more you teach uh, the kids like simple little words and then a little at a time, you teach them bigger words, add on to it, this and that. After, then when they get older, like me, they'll uh, really want to understand what their language is about. And from that, like you give on, uh, your, your view changes of what your people really are. For the parents, this school and the Freedom School in Akwasazni are a matter of principle. For the children, it's still school, and the favorite subject is recess. <laughs> the Abenaki Self-Help Association, right? Okay. All right. Uh, anything else about Davis Project you probably didn't know, besides the Regan Center? The alternative schools aren't the only ones changing when it comes to teaching Indian culture and history. Public schools in and around the Akwesasne Reservation now offer Mohawk language courses, and here at Missisquoi Valley Union High School, kids can now take a Native American course. And in 1678, the first real life, the Abenakis, they, they began a war with the British, which had lasted for many, many years. What we're really trying to do is actually build their self-esteem. We do have a population within our school, which is 20%, that have some heritage dealing with Native Americans. They receive help from the Abenaki Self-Help Association. Uh, and what we're trying to do really in conjunction is through Mr. Clark, Principal, and Mr. Kreps, is to establish the idea that Native Americans are always making an impact on us. And that we need to show them that we are proud of them as Vermonters. Improving education is probably where the Abenaki of Vermont have made their greatest strides. Eight years ago, about 70% of the high school dropouts here were Abenaki. Today, well, that statistic has dropped to 21%. Child is a success if a child can get through school, get the diploma, but again, more importantly, has got the skills uh, to make
choices, because that's what this is really all about. Jeff Benet runs the Indian Education Office in Swanton. He says they've been successful because of counseling and because they got the schools to change their perception of Indians, past and present. This after-school group also helps, run by Donna Marshall Patch. It teaches Abenaki children at an early age to be proud of who they are. I mean, we certainly would like to send a positive message out there that, um, you know, being Native American is certainly something that they should be real proud of. And uh, we're hoping that this will be one way that the, that the young people can, can feel that way. I think the neatest thing is to see an awakening in them. You know, become, becoming aware of how special it is that they are Native American, you know, having them really clue into that. I think that that's something that's, I find the most gratifying. The children are learning Native American dances, and after a bit more practice, they plan to perform at the State House in Montpelier. The after-school group is, for the most part, fun for the kids. But everything is related to their heritage. Even a simple fable is chock full of Indian philosophy. A great bird stood on top of the hill. Two, as it held its wings open wide, light beamed out. Who is that, Skunk asked? That is the day, Go said Biscotti. While his wings are open, it is dead. If he closes them, it will be night. Skunk looked and saw it was so. Scrabby fell asleep. Skunk thought, though, did not sleep. He took a bottle of rawhide and went to the place where the eagle stood. He bound the great eagle's wings so that it, it could not open them. When morning came, there was no daylight. The birds and animals were frightened and confused. The Scrabby found his way in the, in the dark back to the day eagle's hilltop. Then Gooscobby tried to untie the knots. Skunk had tied. They were very tight, so tight Gooscobby could not untie them off. He could only free one of the day eagle's wings. To this day, the day eagle can only open one wing. So it is that only the, half the world has daylight at any time for the day eagle must keep turning around on his hilltop to share the daylight with all the world. The Abenakis really have broken new ground in Indian education. Their school programs are really quite a success story. Sometimes when you hear about all the conflict, the headline-making news, it's easy to overlook some of the positive things, and there's really an awful lot of An them. awful lot. For example, in Akwesasne. The Mohawks are building a $2 million health center, one of just a few in the country owned entirely by Indians. And the Abenakis are working on plans for their own museum. And as for the Ganyanka, well, they've proven to the world that they can survive in a community like theirs. We also tend to forget that amid all the turmoil, there are people living their lives and raising their families, people who laugh and love and dream of a better future for their children. It's not always easy raising a family on the reservation. Beyond all the usual family struggles, from paying bills to getting children to cooperate, families such as the Ransoms also face some unusual obstacles. The, um, the reservation has a status in which you can't get a bank loan to build. So you've either got to buy an existing home, and, like what we did, or you've got to build a part of the time. Akwesasne has a status in which it's uh, trust land. So um, although individuals within within its territories have individual property rights, it's not considered that in, in a view from the outside. You know, if if somebody defaults on a mortgage, then they can repossess the home off reservation but if it occurs on that can occur so um, that's why banks are reluctant to to uh, give loans for home, home construction Jim and Carla Ransom are lucky with the help of parents and grandparents they did scrape together enough cash to buy their home and they do appear to be a happy American family and they are 
They are also Mohawks, proud of it, and very serious about building a future for their children. But I just want to be able to give something back to the community. Then to go away and, you know, we could say, well, sure, I could go away and I could make a lot of money somewhere else. And, and, but I don't think I would be as happy. There's, I think, five of us. Um, Harold Tiger who's the chief now. Myself, there's Michael Cook, who's our health service director. And there's um, Benson Kelly, who's our doctor, are all from the same graduating class. And we've all come back to the community after getting an education. So that's, that's the trend I see for the future. It's a complete reversal of the past and the more coming back and, and helping the community out. I think that's the only way we can have a future. And both Jim and Carla are committed to the future. Carla works for health services on the reservation, and Jim is Akwesasne's main environmental soldier, taking on corporate giants who pollute Indian land. And don't let the mild-mannered family man image fool you. When it comes to protecting the environment, Jim is tough and successful. The Environmental Protection Agency has signed um, con uh, administrative orders against Alcoa and Reynolds, which, tells, which directs them to get out into the river, to clean it up, and to remediate it. And with GM, it is a, a, a Superfund site, so they are already under a separate agreement with EPA. So uh, what we're trying to do now is coordinate all three activities so they're done roughly in the same time frame. How long and how much money? Um, in terms of how long, the best example I can give is with General Motors. Um, with the entire site, we're probably looking at another seven years before it can be cleaned up. And I would expect uh, a similar time frame for, for the other two industries also, in that the areas are so large that it, you just can't clean it up in a day. In terms of cost, uh, estimates for the GM site range in, the, in, in value from anywhere from $100 million to $300 million. And that's, that's, and that's just for this one site. Jim says his fight to stop the pollution has brought him back to traditional Indian values, values where the land is sacred. He says it's really very simple. He just wants to preserve the land for his children and his children's children. Traditional values are the foundation of the Ganyanka Mohawks. The Indians living here are intensely protective of their privacy. Few outsiders are ever allowed beyond this gate. We got our view of Ganyanka from this young man. Daryl Martin says the rules of his community are really very simple. No drinking, no drugs, and no religion other than the traditional worship of the land. That's all we are, is we're just caretakers of the land. We're not here to own the land. We can never own the land. We can just take care of it. Just say, this is what we're going to take care of. You can have a thousand dollars today, and tomorrow you could have nothing. If you have land, and you have land, it's always there. And if that land is taken care of, the land will provide for you. One way or another, it will provide for you. When they first set up this alternative Indian community, the Ganyanka Mohawks hoped to live off the land. But money was always a problem. To outsiders, this high-stakes bingo hall is now the most visible part of Ganyanka. And some say it clashes with their traditional philosophy. Martin explains the apparent contradiction this way. The bingo hall is, is only a stepping stone to achieving what we ultimately want to achieve, which would be self-reliance and self-sufficiency. We want to improve our lifestyles. We want to improve the conditions that uh, our children will grow up in. And all these things take money. And so we realize in order for us to to, to get ahead to any certain extent that we would, it would, we would need some kind of an income. So we chose a bingo operation. That's a good bingo. Any other bingo? And the lifestyle here is sometimes difficult, almost like homesteading. Few homes have electricity, for instance. But Martin says they've come a long way in 15 years, adding quickly, though, they've got a long way to go. Before, it was easy. You put a roof over your head, and, and you put food in your stomach. It was easy. But now, as time goes on, it's like, okay, well, now we've got all that, and it's taken for granted. But now we've got to worry about 
you know, we got to worry about managing a bingo enterprise. We got to worry about managing our horses yet, and and our land, and and how people perceive us, and how in the next five years how we're going to grow, and in what areas we're going to grow, and so how are we going to manage to bring all these things together and at the same time keep our people on track. The Missisquoi River is symbolic for the Abenaki Indians of Vermont. Hundreds of years ago, they lived along its rich banks. Today, they live in and around the town of Swanton. Abenaki leaders work out of this old building, leased from the railroad for a dollar a year. It's true, the Abenakis don't have much money. But Doris Meekler will tell you that that's just not important. Doris is known as a spiritual leader. When you first meet her, surrounded by her treasures, she seems like an eccentric. But listen to her for a while. She does speak with a certain wisdom. Now, when I get discouraged and lose my strength, I go out and hug a pine tree. In the Indian tradition. <laughs> my energy is the father of the forest. Like my grandmother used to always tell me. That's a major source of strength for not only the trees that stand out there, but for the humans who want to be like a tree. I feel the general people, especially not Native Americans, feel that they've got to be on a, a rollaway or whatever your roller coaster and keep on going so fast that they miss what they were here for in the first place. You're living too fast, going too fast, and missing out, missing out on so much beauty by being in a hurry to get through with life and what do they have with them when it's finished. And those words of wisdom bring us to the end of our program tonight. And there is, of course, more to the Native American story that we could ever possibly tell you about in just an hour. But we do hope that you've gained some insight into these Indian societies. We certainly have. Throughout tonight's show, we've heard a lot of talk about the children. And like most people, Indians have a vision of a better future for them. And we leave you tonight with the people who will inherit that dream. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night. They can teach your parents well. Their children's hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dream. The one they fix, the one you'll know by. Don't you ever ask them why If they told you you would cry So just look at them and sigh